Welcome to the chaos. <laughs> it's a whole production here. It's Tosa. a whole thing. What up, everybody? And welcome back to the chaos. I'm your host, Mikey Tableman. I'm Danny J. Gomez. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Look at this stuff. Straight. So I love having people back from season one on because we get to like really keep up and, you know, everybody knows the story. But it's been a while since this man's on. Um, Costa Ronan, how are you? What's up? Great to be back, guys. Nice right. to Welcome you. back. We always appreciate like the new set. Like we actually put in time and effort and have like a whole thing now. Yeah, I was. Uh, <laughs> I remember being here. I was like, I remember distinctly being like my back was to that wall and I was facing this way. Yeah. And now it's all like uh, we were the just, whole set going. We were just sitting on the couch shooting. Sh like you asked me if it was the same place. <laughs> it's like I mean, but it is. It looks yeah. way different. Just keep rotating the walls to give it a perspective of a oh, every, different yeah. place every single time. Oh, season season three, it'll be completely set up differently. But yeah, we, I mean, most people don't know this, but this is my f***ing apartment. This is where I live and I sleep and I eat and I do all my things. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, why pay for a studio at this point? Right. We can just right. use it here. So, but Costa, what's up, man? We haven't seen you in a while. There's been a, you've been on a couple different TV shows. You've gotten married. You've lived in multiple cities. What's going on? Uh, well, you know, life. When was the last time we saw each other? Well, we all got together recently, but before that, it's been pre-pandemic, pre probably, because you moved. Yeah, yeah. We didn't see you during, I mean, I know you two caught up when you were in New York, in but New York, I haven't yeah. seen you. I mean, we've caught up here and there, but I haven't yeah. seen you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the pandemic, post-pandemic, I got a gig in New York, so I had to approve my whole family and go to New York and set up shop there, and uh, so we did one season of that. Uh, I think that's when... You and I caught up in New York as well, right? Yeah. And then uh, uh, you were doing a play. I was I was doing the reading. So this must have been like 2022. Or was that? Was it? It was after pandemic. It was bro. right after. Yeah. Yeah, because it was, I was doing, um, I was there doing a reading. And then we did the play later that year. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. when we caught up. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember we were right by Ripley Greer Studios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it was like the little coffee shop or something yeah. that you near yeah, the hotel where you were staying. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. dude, it's like it's it's crazy how quickly the time flies, huh? It's oh, just God. like chop, 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 chop. But that that so after we saw each other, that was probably towards the end of the year. The show ended, and uh, uh, we're like, I I need a purpose in life. You know, I don't like being in places like New York if I don't have anywhere to go or anything to do like i always find something to do but i can do it anywhere else i just need an airport to go to work um but i feel like new york is one of those places where people a lot of the time artificially make themselves feel busy you know there are people who are busy and then this because of the general vibe of the city a lot of the people pretend to be busy and i don't like pretending to be busy i'd rather you know what my job is done i can get out i can go do something else somewhere else and i genuinely do and so, end of the year, my wife and I. Uh, when did we, you get married again? Uh, 20, 2020? Three, uh, four years ago now, yeah. yeah. So, we went sailing. Uh, we uh, jumped on a sailboat, went down to the Bahamas, her, me, and the dog, and we spent four months, three months sailing. What is that? The like? islands. It's pretty good. I mean, it's that's, pretty good. It sounds so it, it fun. It sounds enjoyable. There's living yeah. around. But then being on the yeah. ocean is kind of scary. Well, for me, it'd be really scary. I could do it. Why would it be scary? <laughs> Lieutenant Dan over here. <laughs> <laughs> you can still swim. I can can't? make that joke. Oh yeah, I could swim. But when if I swim like this, my ass pops up and it throws my head under under the water. So I got to swim like sideways. And <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry, but let's get back to the sailing. No, it because it, it looks like such a fun adventure. Sailing was incredible. Yeah, you know, like I, I started sailing when I was a young kid uh, back in Russia and went through all the sandboards, dinghy sailing into ocean racing, and now it's kind of like so much a massive, massive part of me. It's very hard to deny, and so every now and then I gotta get back into that sort of adventure and just see the horizon. And kudos to my wife for trusting me. To yeah. go <laughs> for like see just the horizon. Uh, the dog didn't really have a choice. She's just like, yeah, yeah, like food, drink, you know, I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, so we shoved off from North Carolina where the boat was on the sticks on December 26th. 
on Boxing Day, uh, sailed down to Florida, uh, provisioned all the rest, crossed over to the Bahamas on January 1st. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically for four months, it was just like hopping from key to key and like anchoring and living off the boat and the land and the sea. And it was amazing. You know, it was at that time of the year when there's no work. Everybody's kind of in pre-production or post-production or sort of in between seasons. So we're like, yay, you know. And then, of course, while we were there, the strike happened. And we're like, well, <laughs> where do we go there? <laughs> right, right. Because normally you kind of like you finish one work and you're like, okay, well, let's wait to see where the next work is going to take you, right? Because there's no point of getting a place like either like LA, New York or whatever, and then ending up going for, you know, to Kansas for six years, you know? So you're like, let's wait and see. And then the strike happened and we're like, well, let's wait and see. And then the strike sort of continued for like 10 months or six months or whatever it was. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of very, very, uh, uh, interesting times for everybody during that time so yeah the strike ended got a job now we're here catching up with you boys and uh freestyling in your new studio which feels amazing to right, be back right. wait so when you were in new york though it was for the sitcom and then the sitcom no that was a, a tv show for uh nbc called the end game okay yeah so the, the very first job after the uh um, the pandemic was this film in north carolina um about space and then then i came back here my wife finished in new hampshire and uh and yeah so nbc the end game was the job that took us to new york in the first place okay so you're out sailing and then uh the the pandemic or the the strike happens and you're just kind of waiting like everyone else but you're enjoying life and well, we came, we're like, we were there when it started to happen because remember, like, there was talk about it first, and then there was a, a writer's strike, and then yeah. it transitioned into actor's strike. So nobody knew what's going on, how long it's going to take, right? So we're all on the same boat, figuratively and physically, yeah, right? right? So we came back stateside in, I think, March or April. And, you know, I was like, well, I got to, you know, like just like the pandemic, got to pick up new skills, got to learn something new. I'm just going to sit around there waiting, right? So I started writing again, started reading more, sort of going back to basics and learning more about boat maintenance, which uh, proved itself to be a useful skill on the <laughs> Hell yeah. you know? So it's like you basically, you are that guy who takes the trash out, captains the boat and, and fixes everything yourself. So Yeah, yeah and, that, and now you can yeah. like, you can bring that into your your acting world. Like this guy knows how to maintenance a boat. Can fix actually, the toilet. Yeah, fix the toilet. <laughs> Let's do a sitcom where Costa is a plumber. Yeah, you know, you could actually do the plumbing. But I mean, I got a question for the both of you. Then, like, you know, I've, I talked to both of you during the strikes, and how challenging was that though? Because like, yo, you don't know when your next job is coming from. You like you said, you're going from job to job waiting. You can, you don't want to settle down and buy a house anywhere or anything because you don't know exactly what the next move is going to be. And then also, you know, once the strike ends, it's going to be a while until you can get back to work because content was behind and studios had to figure everything out. So like mentally, what was that like for the both of you? Because that had to be challenging and frustrating. I mean, uh, I'll just go real quick. I don't even remember what, what I did last year. Like I, I remember... I did go to a few strikes. Like I did uh, walk the line and do that stuff. So I wanted to stay active and be out there and join the community. But I, w I was also, I was, I was still in classes. So I was going to a weekly acting class because I, I just wanted to stay sharp. Yeah. Because I knew, well, I thought, like we all thought that when the strike ended, it was just going to be like, a, you know, a freight train of work. But that didn't really happen. So I just, I try to stay busy like you you know, with writing and, and, and reading and stuff like that um, and my, with my class. But, you know, for the most part, it was, it was terrifying. Like, you, you, you know, it's like my main, the, when the career just kind of ends, you don't really know where to go from there. So it, it, you have to find something. something to fill the space, right? I mean, I had that during the pandemic because I had no idea when my job was going to come back, but that's how we ended up with all of this but like i feel like on that part it's got to be you know at least i knew there was something coming back too and i had consistent work but i feel like in your guys's realm it's got to be so much harder there's so many people trying to then land all these different jobs that are coming back i mean there's been a plethora of content though that's come out on tv since 
since the strike though. And I feel like there's even more just continuing to come and come. Yeah. Is the quality of the content that matters as well. You know, like it, it felt like the pandemic definitely affected the quality of the content that's been coming out. Uh, because there was such a huge need for content that a lot of the time networks and the decision makers are going like, well, yes, it's not good enough, but we need it. We need to fill the space. We need to people to continue to watch something. Let's get the, you know, let's go. And the, that's why you see a lot of the time so much, so many cancellations because, you know, they throw money at making something. It doesn't take off, you know, including the show that I was on in New York massive budget but didn't didn't gel with the audience you know nobody watched it and got canceled and was like well it's just part of the industry it's part of what happens where there wasn't it was a great idea originally it just wasn't executed in the right way and so that's kind of seems to be you know that seems to be an issue like with the pandemic and also the writer's strike you know writer's strike okay well you know there's there's picket lines every day but then the writers come home and they still write so then the writer's strike is over They've got a whole bunch of scripts they can present and say, okay, listen, you know, we can do this, we can do this, we can do that. And then depending on the mandate, the networks pick up, you know, this project, this story, that story, and then sort of make it that way. And you're right, Daniel, like the expectation was that the freight train of work is going to come through, but then ultimately everything ended up being funneled down. Yeah. You know, not only, you know, you and I weren't employed, but also people at the top level weren't employed. So they kind of got the piece of the pie first and then it kind of trickled down to everybody else right so yeah that's kind of how how it worked you know but ultimately the there's so much content out there and so much need for content as well you know like showtime is now part of paramount right so that's that network um but there's great shows continue to be made you know like yellowstone continues to be made and all those bunch of other shows continue to be made but there's also a lot of shows that are like white noise you know you just turn it on and you go cook your dinner nobody cares about what it's about there's no message it's just like it's just something's happening you know i i'm, I'm curious to hear uh when the when the pen when the strike ended what was the first job or first auditions that came your way because I, i've told you this when we met last time but my experience <clears throat> the strike ended and the next day, literally the next day, I got a commercial audition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was excited because whatever, we're, we're, auditions are coming in. I was like, the next day. So I go in, do the commercial audition, and I find out a few days later that I book it. National commercial, it's the end of the year. So I'm like, this is a great way to end the year. So I'm all excited. And my friend comes in to visit. And, like, I was having my little, like, entourage moment. Like, my best friend comes in. I just booked a commercial. We were, like, going to go out on the weekend. And uh, they tell me I have another audition for the same office. And I'm, I'm just feeling that positivity, you know, that energy. Where I feel unstoppable. So I go into the office with my best friend. I pick him up from the airport. We go, I go to the audition, show him my world. And uh, we go to start the weekend and I'm in the hotel room and my, my agent calls. And I, in my head, I'm like, oh, I booked another one. You know what I mean? <laughs> butterflies she, are coming up she yeah. Called, yeah and i'm like james hold on to my best friend hello hey yeah yeah what's going on uh my agent says hey i'm just checking in on you uh i actually call with bad news and i'm like what, what, what do you mean she's like you you lost the commercial and i was like which the one that i just went on she's like no the one that you booked and i'm like wait what what so I'm not doing a commercial. She said, no, they had to let you go from the commercial because the space that they booked was not accessible for your, for you and your wheelchair. So they can't, they can't use you for the commercial. And I was like, well, what's wrong? Uh, she said, there's too many stairs and the doorways aren't wide enough. I was like, I will get my friend. He's here right now. He will pick me up and bring me up those stairs and like, we'll make it happen. And she's like, I, I, I try to fight for you, but they said it was too much of a risk and they don't, you know, in case you get hurt. So just like that, we go a whole year with no work. The day after I get a commercial, I book it, and then it's gone in like a blink of an eye. And, uh, and so I didn't work at all last year. So, you know, that, that re man, I don't know how I've dealt with that mentally, but I, I, you, I guess, you know, now you just, that's the nature of the industry. You never know, mm. right? 
So uh, I'm curious. Well, deflating though, like deflate. Oh, I got I got wasted that day. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. But it wasn't like another it, entourage moment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it wasn't like a celebratory, like yeah, yeah, the job, you know. And I'll, I'll be set for you know, national commercial can set you for a whole year. Yeah. You know, they pay well, but you know, it it went away, and it was just such a bummer. But I'm curious to see what your experience was like when the when the strike ended. What jobs came your way, or like what auditions? Or it's it, listen, we're all in the same boat, man. Yeah, you know, jobs come, jobs go, auditions come, auditions go. Sometimes you don't want to do it because it's like, you know, you're thinking about the legacy, right? What is what is it that you stand for as an artist, right? Because very early on in my life, I have made a decision that I'm not going to be a part of the the b paddling machine of like, this is how we see the Russians, you know, thick accent, bears walking down the street, everybody is drunk, you know, women are prostitutes and men are gangsters, like, f that, this is not life, people are not like this, and this is not Russian society, and I'm not going to be paddling this shit ever. So, I, like, when I worked security, when I worked clubs, back in Australia, I never played those roles. I would rather go and like have my Yoshinoya at four o'clock in the morning for two bucks than pedal that shit. And I was fortunate that it paid off. So by the time I got to do the Americans, it was like, it was an intelligent character. I was able to build that character. And the Americans is a show, I think we touched on it last time while I was here. It changed the industry. It changed the industry in a way where we now know and are okay watching shows in foreign languages where foreign characters are not just like they're a token diversity character. No, we now know that foreign characters can move the story and, and, and tell the story and the audience will watch in foreign characters. Everything from, you know, a lot of the rings and people, you know, like characters speaking in Elvik and we're like, this is awesome. You know, to Narcos, where characters are speaking in, in Spanish, and we're like, we will watch this. We will read the subtitles for the show that's worth it. Then we're watching Spanish Money Heist in Spanish. We watch it. You know, we, we love it. And then we watch Shogun, that just got nominated for a whole bunch of Emmys, right? In Japanese. The language, like, okay, we get Spanish because it's kind of like a romantic language. We're kind of close to English. We get it. But Japanese. And people watch it. Not people, not just watch it, but love it and promote it, and it's up for a whole bunch of Amy's. You remember Squid Games? Like, had exactly everybody was into Squid Games when that during the pandemic when that came out. Yeah, yeah. With those smarter characters, with the characters that actually are real, that's what's interesting to play. And so, kind of, it's a two way answer. The easier way to is to for writers to always to come back to the templates right so you know to sort of pre-americans let's call it that that way russian or european characters right because i don't just play russian right i play eastern european i play international characters so that was that but a lot of the a lot of the auditions that came in were not something i wanted to do for that reason right and uh but then there were like a few in between that were like oh this is very interesting you know this is this is not that guy this is an international character this is a smart character this is a character that's actually it's going to move the needle in a career sense you know it's not just going to be a job that's going to pay the bills it's going to be a job that's going to fulfill me creatively and be seen yeah and give me an opportunity to have access to a uh, greater material better material wider variety of material down the track because ultimately what is it for you creatively if you don't feel satisfied creatively then you should get out if, you know there's a lot of people who are happy playing the same roles and they kind of make a niche out of it and they just milk that cow for the rest of their days it's not me i don't judge but it's just not for me i would rather go and sail like it's just not interesting yeah, you don't want to be stuck in that white noise. Then. No, no, exactly, exactly. You just you, you go and you write your own material. It doesn't matter whether or not it gets gets produced. You write it and you shelve it. You know, if nobody wants to look at it, nobody wants to look at it. But as you write it, you go on the journey with your, with those characters. 
you know, and you still feed yourself creatively. You have to feed yourself. And then, you know, if nobody wants to hire you and nobody wants to work with you, then it's okay. Go to something else. But stay true to your principles of the legacy you want to leave behind and what you want to be known to, for as an yeah. artist, you know? It's so, it's so great that you just said that because I, I had something come in recently that I just did not gel with at all. And the problem is, you know, being disabled, we, we just, people just don't, first, they don't know how to write for us. It's usually not someone with a disability writing our parts. And then if, when they do write them, they're just generic. And, uh, you know, this came in, it was supposed to be a comedy and I just didn't connect with it at all. I didn't find this character. There was no character development, just not interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I, I did the audition just because there's, there's no, nothing else. But in my heart, I was like, is this something that I really want to be doing? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's, it's, it's a fine line that I'm, that I'm walking where like, do I just work to work or do I just wait? You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's really difficult. It's, it's, it's a balance. Yeah. It's a balance. It's, it's work to work. Working to work is important. You know, you have to, I mean, you're a professional actor. You're a handsome guy. You're a leading man type. And so, and so the right job will come. I have absolutely no doubt about it. Because even if you feel like when you're sitting at home and you're crying, like, f***ing hey, when is this going to change? Were People you are, watching me this last week? <laughs> <laughs> Every That's single, literally me the whole week. Every single artist, bro, from the times of like humankind painting the walls of the caves yeah. to now, every single artist was struggling, was misunderstood, and was making those noises all through the all through life. It doesn't matter if you made it or you haven't made it. It's exactly the same, just on a different level. You know, first you're like, hey, why didn't I get the student film? Then you're like, hey, why didn't I get that show? Why didn't I get that Costa, Gestas, you know, lead? And then, you know, like Al Pacino is like, hey, why, you know, like, why, didn't, why didn't I hear about this thing? Well, you know, you were away. You know? Right, right. So everybody's going through the same thing. So just stick to your guns, bro. Like working to work is important, but never work because it's, that's the only thing available. Because as long as you work for, you know, to do what, just because it's available, People will continue to write shit for you. Not you personally, but just, you know, whether you are Russian, whether you're disabled, whether you're French, whether you're Japanese, whether you are tall, short, whatever, you know? Like, we live at a time when if you want to find, uh, you know, a, a one-legged uh, man in his 40s with a beard to play a pirate, you will literally find that person. He will even look like a pirate and have two earrings. He's sitting right there. Yeah. You know? I could be a pirate. Exactly. Arr. It's like, all you got to do is like dress him up and period and send him on his merry way. Yeah. We live in that world where there's so many, we're not on the studio system anymore where there was like, you know, 20 actors working and they're like on five-year contracts. No, like literally like you can have anybody. And you don't even need professional actors anymore, unfortunately to say, but like it's like 15 minutes of fame or five minutes or whatever the saying was, it's happening. Yeah. You know? I think it's even less than 15 at this point like, for, for some people. You see, like, the amount of money like TikTok people are making is insane. It's yeah. insane. Crazy. And what it's peddling is the idea of like, f*** education. Why would I need to go to college or university? Why, would, why do I need to be a, a productive member of the society when I can like, you know, twerk and, and make money and then buy a multi-million dollar house? But this is their legacy. You know, again, I'm not judging this is their path, but you make at some point a decision, right? What contribution do you want to make to the society? This is their contribution. And I also think like we talked, we've talked about green, uh, green lights before McConaughey's book. And obviously it's a whole different person, but he talked about in the book, how he was just so typecasted as the rom-com guy. And he's like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do that anymore. And then for about, I think it was like 16 months, he didn't work. And he's like, I've something will come, something that's better, something that's better. Then he won an Oscar. Because then Dallas Buyers Club was the first thing that happened. There was a whole lot of hardship getting that whole thing made, but it was like that whole like, 
I'm going to hold out for what I want. And then also like, I mean, I truly believe when you put that into the universe, that energy comes back, that vibration. And it's like, if you really want it, you hold out for it and you have the patience, it is going to come to you. Yeah, absolutely. But it's just Brilliant trusting book. it. Oh, it's one of my favorite yeah. books. Especially yeah. listen to the audio book and him reading it. Oh, yeah. It's so good. It's great. It's so good. The narration. I love any audio book that like the person, like Viola Davis's audio book was amazing too. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah. So yeah, man, I mean, he's 100% right. It's it's coming. We all know it's coming for you. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And it's it's just those, 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 uh, where it's such a lonely profession. Yeah. And it's so like, you 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 really have to have the thickest skin because it's nothing but rejection. Yeah, and you and know what? But also, <laughs> it's a very lonely road as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the further up that mountain you climb, the lonelier it gets. The view gets better, but it's f***ing lonely. Man. And at some point, you turn around and you're like, you know, the whole concept of the same elevator, you know, like 20 years down the track, we will still be, you know, sitting around, kicking back, having a beer and talking about the last 20 years. But, a lot of the time, you know, there's less space and there's less people around you. People yeah. peel off. People sort of lose interest. People lose faith. You have to keep going. Yeah, that's so, I mean, I'll never quit. It's just this, this like past, you know, I, I did a, I did a play in New York earlier this year. Yeah. And, uh, which was incredibly successful too. Very successful. And you were brilliant. Off Broadway. We had, you know, we had Kira Sedgwick in the cast and we we got tons of press. And, it, you know, like you said, in, in New York, it feels like you're busy even when you're not mm. because there's so much energy, so many people. So when I came home, I was like, I was ready to come home. I was missing just, I, I don't know, I was just exhausted. That, that's a whole nother, well, we can do this on a, ca on a catch up, but physically and mentally exhausted. So when I was ready to come home, and like the first few days, I was like, oh man, I'm relaxing. There's no, I have no, no place to be. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks, the quiet, the, the nothing, the no phone call, the no, I have to be here for this interview or do the play or do an, a, you know, do something. And, and slowly but surely it started like building and building. And I'm like, I just fell into this deep depression, the post-show blues that people were talking about. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's not going to happen to me. And boy, it hit me hard. Yeah. And there was just nothing coming in, no prospects. And and I just, you know, the anxiety and everything got to me so bad that I just, I couldn't even like find time to, for me to like go out and find my yacht and to do something. So the- But know, it's not just the yacht, dude. It's like, it's, it's the internal stimuli versus the external stimuli, yeah, right? Yeah. Like when you're doing a show, like you feel like you're being fed, right? Like you-, you something's happening around you that makes you go to work every day. That's why a lot of people need that. They, in order to sort of mentally be okay in life, they need that nine to five. They need somebody to tell them what to do every single day of their lives. Otherwise, they just get lost, yep. right? But then there are other people who feel suffocated, like you fellas, right? Like, you never had nine to five, right? Because like, put you in a nine to five office right now, you'd be like, what the f is this? Losing my right? mind. Go with losing, yeah. right. losing my mind. Yeah. Not only that, but people telling you what to do. And it's, it's not nine to five anymore. You come home and it's like five till uh, 10 at home working as well because of somebody else told you what to do, right? Yeah. So the, the, the post-show blues is real, 100%. But then once there are no more external stimuli, that's when you look inward, mm -hmm. right? Like last time we talked about it, like during the pandemic, you started writing again. You guys created this awesome podcast right so like all this exists because there were no external stimuli for you guys and you created this awesome platform so you don't need a hobby you don't need the boat just go back and write go back and read you know yeah yeah and it's a thing about like you know i feel like time is I mean, time is just passing by yeah, just so quickly. And I just feel like I'm wasting time. I need to be doing something. So I kept like, you know, and I still do it. I'm like, I, I need to be doing something. I need to be doing something instead of like grounding and just being like, okay, it's take this time. Cause I know, like I have a feeling that it's just going to be get crazy out of nowhere. And I'm going to be wishing for this time, like that I had nothing to do. You know yeah, what I mean? yeah, yeah. But uh, it's just something, you know, it's just like a learning experience. Like, like you said, you it's a it's a different part of the hill. It's just the view is is better, you know. 
But then like, sometimes I feel like I'm still at the bottom of the hill looking up, you know? You're way, like, you can't even see the bottom. You never see, yeah. No, you, you can't see the bottom. Yeah. Like, you're already so f far up, you, you think you're at the bottom. Right. Because you can see how big the mountain is. Right, right. But if you look down, the bottom is down there, like, past the clouds. Like, don't worry about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, like well, we have tons of episodes for you to go back and listen to to hear how degenerate you used to be. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a very, very long way. Yeah, you used I to know. be very cloudy. Yeah, very oh. cloudy. <laughs> <laughs> I could not see I where were, we were going. Yeah, I was literally, I was in the water. Yes. Neck deep. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but one of the things you were saying, though, is like something that like I've really put so much effort into. It's like whether I'm really busy or whether I'm not, I got to be able to have peace in both uh, areas. And like trying to thing. find that peace and stillness is like what's I mean, I, I mean, this past year I've been through so much and such a life changing experience for myself. All the things I had, to, you know, really my world stopped. I had to focus only on myself. And that's been my whole focus this past year. And it's like I'm able to find quiet in in all the noise in both sides and like that's what's really kept me going or kept me grounded enough to continue progressing yeah you started doing the legos right that yo i love my legos yeah i do legos um it's like my new favorite thing um you know what once i got sober i needed to find something like my adhd was running crazy my cravings were running like crazy and i was like trying to find different things to do and you know between going to meetings and reddit and all these different things people were like yo try legos so I was trying to puzzles and puzzles gave me more anxiety than that, and it actually helped me um because like i can sit i can write for days um you know i've been working on a book writing poetry but this time i just needed to shut my brain off but then doing Legos is like, it keeps my mind moving. I'm following a direction. I'm, I'm seeing something build. And now where I used to display all my booze and weed is now just tons and tons of Legos. And I'm a big fan. Shout out to Legos. Please sponsor me. Because Legos are more expensive than the drugs were. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Legos are expensive. Yeah. And, that's, and that's a great addiction, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but like, uh, yo, there's so many of my friends that now do Legos and I didn't realize like, yo, Legos have like, apparently they had this massive resurgence during the pandemic because people needed things to do. So now they've like done all these things from all these big time movies and like all these different things that are now Lego affiliate that we, when you were a kid, you're like, oh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Like I just built the Taj Mahal out of Legos and it looks like it's, it was like you did? yeah it's over where, there you see it? The, I got the Taj Mahal the Cathedral of Notre Dame it was like 6,000 oh I see it yeah, it's like yeah. 6,000 pieces it took me a couple of weeks but like it helped me fill my time and keep my peace and you know at this point man like I don't I don't really care what anybody's thought process is of it. It's like, oh, what are you doing Legos? Are you a kid? It's like, yo, man, that keeps me calm. That keeps me sober. That helps me stay sane. I'm going to do my Legos. Yeah. And don't, I don't care. Is that an insult? Like, are you a kid? I want to be a kid. And I want to be a Toys R Us kid. We had so much fun as kids. Our imagination was wild. We didn't care about what people thought about us. Like, yeah, I want to be a kid again, you know? Yeah. Well, the kid in us never dies. You know, the he kid is always there. Up. You know, like every time you get, you get sort of, you get emotional, that's the kid in you. Whether you laugh or cry, that's the kid in you. Like the little kid inside is the one who feels everything. Yeah. Everything, it's like imagine an onion, right? Everything around, the adult shit, the layers is from us being, you know, that's the chaos on the knuckles. You know, that's from us being lied to, cheated on, uh, you know, let down, let down broken. over and over. It's the thick skin. Yeah. You know, but the child is still there. Yes. That's why all that, I mean, that's why, I mean, in therapy, it's all about inner child work. It's like, because mm -hmm. like you said, a lot of those emotions come up. It's a reaction to something. I'm not this upset about what's going on. I'm this upset because like you said, I've been let down so many times. It's now a buildup. And that little child inside of me is just keeping count. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Keep the child alive. Yeah, he's in there. Little Danny? He's ready to play. I mean, little Mikey? Little Mikey. Little, little Mikey man. comes everywhere, bro. I mean, that that's, I, I've done, that, that's been a lot of my focus, man. It's like, the, I didn't realize how much of like childhood trauma and like, I didn't have a bad childhood at all. And that's the thing, like when people hear childhood trauma, you think something really terrible had to happen to you. And it's like, that that's not, you could get, your parents could, you could get lost one time and that will affect you the rest of your life. Like, it's not as deep as people think it is. It's so easy to develop a trigger. It's like you really have to hunker down and really, you know, shadow shadow work, deep dive into what it is and really get a hold of it. And like, when it pops up, I have to be mindful. 
mm-hmm. of stop of stopping myself before I go down that anxiety rabbit hole and being like, hold on, is this is this something to really be that concerned about, or is this just a trigger from something else? And let's okay, and that's how you rewire your brain. You then take the different road. I love it. Every child is traumatized. That's what makes us adults, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. So let's let's bring it back to you and uh and your career and like what's going no, on. No, this in is your good. Life. This is good. This yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was catching up. Yeah, well, we gotta. You know, this is about Costa Ronin over here. You know, it's funny. I was. I, I love was, the conversation though with Costa. It's always yeah. like, like you always get deep very very quickly. Yes. Time passes very very fast. And, and then, then you just sit around contemplating about what we just said. Like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I, I love like, it. I need to really go and deep dive on myself now after this. Where's my Lego set? <laughs> <laughs> I will be doing Legos later on. We have just hit on some things. I um I, I love um for people that haven't heard your your first episode. Like we you used to go and listen to it. They yeah, should, we, sh- we should. And, and just a quick recap. We used to all work in the nightclubs. Yeah. Uh, we were TSAs. You know, we worked the tables and the bottles. And Costa was in the corner doing security. And well, I wasn't I, always in the corner. Well, you know, you were. You don't put Costa in the corner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Costa yelled at me a couple of times. And it wasn't in the corner. <laughs> right. <laughs> But for me, like I saw Kosa, he just, he, he was just so nice and he was always suited up and just very quiet. And he was like that, you know, there was like the, the security guards who were loud and boastful and they're like, I'm strong and me. And, but he was just like very quiet. And I'm like, that guy could ki- probably kill somebody with his finger. And like, that's the guy you had to be scared. But I was never scared of him. But, but, but like, what, we, we never knew that he was flying back and forth to New York to shoot a f- hit show he was <laughs> until he was throwing people out like oh my god aren't you like and i didn't know this i didn't find this yeah. until years later. later years later and then i i went on imdb yesterday and my man's credits are just like a roll like a roll of dice. and i'm yeah. like kosa you, you've done some awesome stuff man like yeah. i it, it just blows my mind that you know anyone else in your position would have been talking about Hey, I was just on this show. Like, I just went over here. You know what I mean? So, like, wh- where does that come from? And can you talk about some of your favorite jobs that you were doing? And but no, I, there's just like a humbleness about this man that is so, so great to be around. It's so refreshing. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks, fellas. It's uh, it's very touching. You guys say that um, actors have this tendency of you know taking credit for everything, for what they've done and what they haven't done. You know, you watch any interview, they're like, yeah, it's like it's. No, it's not because of you. It's you know, yeah. It's because there's like a thousand people from multiple departments who did the work before you even got the role that you are successful and the film is successful and the show is successful. There's definitely an element of, you know, actors breathing life into the characters. For sure, nobody denies that. But there's also a lot of other people who made it, make it possible. And actors forget that. And I see it time in, time out all the time where people are just doing interviews and talking about their process and they're just, you know, taking credit for everything, basically. It's like when it's when it sucks, it's not them. It's the director. When it's awesome, it's always them. Yeah. You know? Uh so favorite projects, man, you know, you you don't know until it's over. You know, when you look back, I definitely uh I definitely, there's like a couple of people that I will never work with again, 100%. Um, but every new project, there's this hope. You know, when you were talking about the the, the sort of the, the silent period after you finish the play, is that moment of hope, that period of hope, right? Like this is all we can, as creatives, as actors who like really everything is out of our hands, we have so much hope. <laughs> we're yeah, like, yeah. We're like puppies, like every day is a new day. Is this the day when I get that call? Is it yeah. the day when I get that job? Is it the right. day when I, you know, something happens? And we learn to live on that hope. And that's why we are like so close to being kids because we live in constant hope. Because you take that hope away from us, we are nothing. Like we can't function. We cannot literally cannot function without having that hope. We break down, you know? And uh, so having that hope is very, very important. So favorite jobs, you know, it's it's the next job. 
you know, I'm doing this show called For All Mankind on Apple. And it's a show that I've been watching for years. Like I read the pilot for that show. Yes. Before it was ever <clears throat> made. Like and and the show starts. It's not, I mean, whatever, if it's a spoiler. The show starts. It's like on season seven. If you haven't watched it, go watch. You're missing out. Like, <laughs> yeah, season, I mean, I so just, season five. Yeah. Season five. But we, I mean, we talked about like content. In my opinion, Apple has the best shows on TV, yeah. hands down. And For All Mankind is one of the longest running ones. Yeah. We're like, filming season five right now. Yeah, yeah. I watched the first couple. I mean, I'm going to watch it again now because you're in it. But it was, oh, the writing was amazing. So yeah, yeah. continue. Like the yeah. first episode, I was like, oh, shit. That's what this is about. Yeah, I just started yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So the 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 for those of you like you have seen it, but for those of you who have not, it's it starts out with the landing on the moon footage that we all have seen. Uh, I don't know, a gazillion times. You know, the the spaceship and the you know the the the, the walk down the steps, <clears throat> and then the flag gets planted, and it's a Soviet flag. It's not the American flag, like what we know happened in history, and you're like. What? <laughs> and this was the most grabbing moment in, in like in a script that I have read probably my whole life. It was an incredible turn of events. And that's in the pilot, like pretty much like on the first page, right? And I I was watching the show. I love the show, the writing, the acting. I think Joel Kinnaman has gonna ha, has done a, an amazing, phenomenal job with the character of Ed, you know, the, the way they aged him. But it, he doesn't just rely on prosthetics and the makeup. He becomes that older person with his walk, with his talk. Like when you guys watch this current season or like even season four, last season, phenomenal, phenomenal work. So this is the show that I'm a part of right now. It's become sort of uh, this uh, TV uh, royalty and I'm like... Uh, you know, got inserted into this TV royalty. Now. Yes. Uh, and it's great fun. It's a great fun. It's a great job to be a part of. And it's awesome to be surrounded by people who whose attention to detail and whose standards are so incredibly high. When you look at yourself and you're like, you know, like I have high standards and I, I, I work hard for what I do. When you're surrounded by people who do more and who have higher standards, you're like, Hey, I got to step up and you step up. And that's what makes you a, a better person, a better creative, a better man, a better actor, writer, director, producer, and so on and so forth. And it's just fantastic. And, and was that uh, one of the first things that came after the, the writer strike or the actor strike? No, I did a film uh, internationally. I did a film we shot in the Dominican Republic for a month and then we shot in Mexico for a month. Wow. That was the first job. That was, literally came on the back of, of the uh, of the strike. But that was that was fun too. What was so that? We were was getting it? ready to go sailing and then this job came and I'm like, well. What was the name of that project? Uh, that was called uh, Another Day in the Sun. Okay. Yeah, because it was, I'm trying to translate from Spanish. Uh, Another Day in the Sun. It's not out yet, so we'll see when it comes out. I'll let you guys know. Yeah, you got to let us know for yeah, sure, yeah. man. Always, it's always great when I'm just watching TV, right? I'm like, oh, that's my boy. Like, yeah. It's my favorite thing of like, you, and like when I go home back to New York, I'll watch something and then be like, oh, I know that guy. Like, oh my God, it's amazing. It's like, well, that's just part of like everyday life. Yeah. Like my parents are huge fans of Homeland. So they like, so when they saw me post it, they're like, wait a minute. You know, I'm like, yeah, he's actually everything. They're like, oh my God, that's amazing. We love that show. And I'm right. like, yeah, it's, it's really cool to always get to catch your boys on TV. And I'm very upset I missed your play, but I really would have loved to have been to New York. But like, just when you get, when you see your friends get to live in that artistic space and yeah. doing their thing, like it's amazing. It's just so awesome. Yeah, no, it, it was, it was a great time. They're, they're talking about bringing it, they, they want to try to bring it to LA or the West End uh, in England. Is is one of the big rumors. I'm in LA, so Mike can come watch it. I know, yeah. right? Finally, <laughs> I mean, if, if, if it goes to London, I'm coming out there too, bro. I love, yeah. I love London. They're talking about uh, turning it into a film, but that, that that would take a lot of a lot of rewriting. But uh, yeah, I mean that's that's exciting. But I mean, back to you, like, so you did the film, and then this is something that you really wanted to be part of this show. So, like, how did what happened? How did that come about? Uh trust, trust. Because, you know, it's look, it's, I think, I'm sure we talked about it last time. If not on your podcast, we talked about it over a pint of beer. It's one of those things where, you know, 
when you want a job and you don't get it, you're like, why, why? And what I have learned is that you don't get this job because there's a better one for you. And if you get this job, then they can't bring you back, right? So if you come in as a, as a, as a character in, in a smaller part, they can't bring you back when a better role is written, right? They don't know if that role is ever going to exist. Mm. And you don't know for sure, but you have a, an inkling, faith. You have that faith that, hey, a bigger role, a better role is going to come around. And that's exactly what happened. So for the last four years, there literally there were a bunch of roles. I mean, it's the whole show is about the space race between the Soviet Union and the U.S. continuing, right? So there's a whole bunch of Russian-speaking characters. There's a whole bunch of international characters. There's a whole bunch of American characters in the last four seasons of the show. And then this role came about, and it's perfect. And I'm so glad that I didn't take anything that came from the beginning up until now, because now it's like it's a perfect timing and it's a perfect combination of creative processes, you know? Nice. So faith, bro, faith. You know, just gotta, just gotta believe in it. And that's exactly what happened. So how, how did it come around? Exactly like that. They, they called uh, in winter. They didn't have their role written. They called my agents and they're like, listen, we have this thing in mind. And they started doing a veil checks and to see if I'm on something else. And because, you know, it's like it's a three-year commitment, you know, it's a, it's a big commitment uh, for them and also for me. Uh, so they, they reached out and they were very gracious and we started the conversation going and they had a role written by, I think, April. In April, we started sort of looking at the, the nuts and bolts and the skeletons of the character. And then, you know, like sort of got everything confirmed May, June, and now I'm here, you know? That's amazing. That's, you got to like be a part of the building. Like, that's crazy, man. Having that much faith and trust. And then not only did they just like, they thought of you specifically. Because like, they remembered you. They did. Cool. They, yeah. Like, and you got to be a part you. of building a character into such an like, iconic show that's out right now. That's, that's awesome. But do you know, an interesting thing is like, this is where I keep talking about faith and, 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 and believing in, in the process is that after the Americans, every single role I got was, was written for me. Like, believe it or not, uh, Homeland role was written for me. Yes, I had to audition for it, but later I found out that it was written for me. Wow. That's crazy. Quentin Tarantino, I didn't have to audition. They just called and they just offered. Uh, the end game was written for me. Not only that, they had my character from home, a picture of my character from Homeland when they pitched the show to NBC. You know how they have the yeah. Bible? Yeah, they yeah. have that in the Bible when they pitched the show to the network. That's so That's cool. Sick. And they still made me audition for it. What? Yeah. Yeah. And mind you, like this. But is I'm not, in the Bible. This is not right. This, but they, you don't know it when you audition. But here's the funny thing, right? Like I know it for a fact because the Homeland uh, story came from Alex Ganza, the creator of Homeland. The story about uh, the End Game came from uh, Nick Wooden and Jay Coburn, who created the show. They put that picture on my trailer on day one. The picture that they used in the Bible, and they still have to. They still made me audition for. <laughs> Uh, this show here, I didn't have to audition for, but again, that came out as a, as a result of, uh, previous shows as well. So I can't remember if it, I, I'm pretty sure it was the Americans as well. So you never know, yeah. you know, the green light, the faith, you know, dude, all this is real. It's the, the energy that you manifest out there and just the patience that you acquire over the years. And you just, you just keep on doing your thing. I don't know about you, but every time this man comes on the show, I feel I feel so much better. Because if you, you know, the, you said something, it's like we, that time when you, you, you sit in silence and you're like, you don't know, like, you know, people are still watching you. Even if you're not, people are watching you not do anything. And they see, they watch how you react, whether or not you're fit enough to not do anything. Right, right. You know, whether or not you're going to, Lose your marbles and, and go right. crazy. They're like, you know, I, you know, this guy isn't ready to do this level of work because, right. you know, because you f it up in personal life or professional life, it affects thousands of people. Yes. Thousands of people. You don't show up because of whatever 
whatever you feel that day, there's thousands of people and millions of dollars that are on the line. They need to know that they can trust you with it, you know? And so just trust the process, bro. Trust yeah. the process. You got to find that balance. But you're right, you, you know, and you have conversations like this that you, you don't know how much you need until you have them, right? And we haven't actually got to film in quite a while. Right. I mean, honestly, and a big reason why we film, like, oh man, Kostas is here. We don't know how long he's going to be here for, but we need to, you know, we need to get him back on. So like, we literally set this whole thing up based around your schedule. To be Thanks, I appreciate to it. To be guys. completely yeah. honest, like, and you know, that's like, why this happened. We wrote I, it for you, buddy. We wrote it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm really, really grateful that, that uh, you know, you invited me, and I'm always very happy to talk to you guys, whether on camera or off camera. You know, your family, and and I'm very, very happy to to call you my friends. I love it, man. We love you, bro. And on that note, we know you got to get to filming. So, yo, man, we greatly appreciate you being here. We look forward to watching uh, the new season that's coming out. Keep up on everything. Costa Ronan, check him out. We'll put all of his links, IMDBs and everything on here so you can check out everything that he's doing. Brother, thank you again so much. Thank we you love so you. much. Appreciate you. We'll see you next time on The Chaos. Peace.